This week's episode of the Age of Revolution podcast covers two of the most decisive engagements of the Napoleonic Wars. The first fought at Cape Trafalgar on the southern coast of Spain, and the second at the village of Austerlitz in what is now the Czech Republic. Fought within two months of each other, these conflicts would come to characterize the massive set-piece battles of the era and would reveal a stark contrast between the relative strengths of the combatants. At Trafalgar, England's Royal Navy would provide ample evidence of its commanding presence on the high seas. While at Austerlitz, Napoleon's Grand Army would prove no less dominant on land. This contrast would ultimately dictate the larger military strategies of the respective combatants, leading Napoleon to initiate a continental blockade aimed at choking off trade with the island nation. In turn, England and her allies would seek new routes by which to re-establish that trade and isolate the French. We pick up now with an account of the circumstances leading up to the War of the Third Coalition and the two seminal battles that would set the stage for a continent-wide struggle in the decade ahead. Despite or because of Napoleon's abrupt assumption of political power in the coup d'etat of 19 Brumaire, French politics remained deeply divided and the First Consul's future very much in doubt. In the eyes of Republicans, his takeover was seen as a betrayal of the democratic ideals of the revolution, while royalists tended to view his use of republican forms to create a virtual dictatorship as the height of hypocrisy. Politics, the art of the possible, inevitably demands compromise, yet a middle ground upon which to unify the country was scarcely to be found. The volatility of the situation became apparent on Christmas Eve of 1800, when Napoleon was nearly assassinated on a Paris street. Anticipating his attendance at the opera and learning of his route, the would-be assassins, royalists with English backing, concealed a large bomb in a street-side water wagon, planning to detonate it at the moment Napoleon passed in his carriage. The timing of the fuse was thrown off, however, when Napoleon's reportedly tipsy coachman raced down the street and around a corner before the device was triggered. Though the resulting blast killed or injured dozens of innocent bystanders, it narrowly missed its intended target. Thoroughly enraged by the incident, Napoleon responded with political calculation, quickly blaming it on radical Republicans and using the public outrage it provoked as an excuse to deport a long list of leftist enemies and when his minister of police, Joseph Fouché, tracked down and eventually captured two royalist conspirators in the plot, Napoleon played down the arrests for the sake of his impending concordat with the Catholic Church. Prior to this, relations between the Church and the French Republic had been complicated at best. As noted in the previous chapter, during the Italian campaign, Napoleon was compelled to interrupt the siege of Mantua and march upon Bologna in an effort to prevent a rumored alliance between Pope Pius VI and the Austrians. Though the aging Pius had been duly chastened by the visit, he could scarcely be trusted on his own, and when, in December of 1797, a French brigadier was killed in a riot while on a diplomatic mission to Rome, the incident was used as a pretext to seize the Pope and bring him back to France. Held captive at Valence, he died there in August of 1799, at which point Napoleon was on his way back from Egypt, having yet to assume political leadership. Though embalmed, the Pope's body remained unburied, and it was not until January 1800 that the new First Consul, in a gesture of conciliation toward the Church, offered a formal and ostentatious interment. Indeed, recognizing the political advantage to be gained by a rapprochement with the Vatican, Napoleon entered into negotiations with the new Pope, Pius VII, which resulted in the Concordat of 1801. Finalized in April 1802, the agreement reaffirmed Catholicism as the majority religion of France, yet stopped well short of restoring the Church's former power and influence in French affairs, leaving Napoleon very much in control of France's religious establishment. As favorable as it was to the new French regime, the Concordat was all but eclipsed by an even greater diplomatic success, the Treaty of Amiens, signed March 1802 
which brought an end to the war of the Second Coalition. Together, these two political triumphs would lead to a plebiscite by which Napoleon was granted the title First Consul for Life. Even so, the resulting peace with England would be tenuous at best. While willing to swallow his anger toward his royalist enemies in order to improve his political prospects, Napoleon had clearly neither forgotten nor forgiven the attempt on his life. Thus, a year later, in a scheme to flush out further Bourbonist intrigues, he directed Fouché to send an agent to London with word that French Republicans were ready to join with Royalists in an effort to oust Bonaparte. As expected, the phony plot won English backing, and a series of uprisings was organized with plans for a Bourbon prince to appear at an opportune moment to recover the throne. By January 1804, the chief conspirators had been identified and arrested, yet for the time being the identity of the potential heir remained a mystery. Suspicion eventually fell upon one Louis Antoine, Duc d'Anguin, an obscure aristocrat living along the French border in Baden, from which place he routinely crossed the Rhine to visit his mistress in Strasbourg. Convinced that Dengen was awaiting a signal to assume the French throne, Napoleon ordered his arrest, and on the 14th of March, French dragoons crossed the border and seized the 31-year-old duke in the middle of the night, imprisoning him in the fortress of Vicennes. By some unverifiable means of persuasion, the captive was compelled to admit that he had sworn implacable hatred against Bonaparte as well as against the French and his papers confirmed that he was in the pay of the English. He claimed to know nothing about the plot, however, and the evidence against him was entirely circumstantial. Nevertheless, after an abbreviated trial, he was placed before a firing squad and summarily shot. The execution of Dengien outraged royalists throughout Europe, providing Napoleon's enemies abroad with damning evidence of his dictatorial excesses and prompting even Fouché to suffer Machiavellian misgivings. It was worse than a crime, he quipped. It was a mistake. Even so, within France, accounts of Dengen's guilt were generally believed, and far from suffering political fallout from the execution, Napoleon eventually used the incident to maneuver the tribunate into offering him the highest of honors, the hereditary title of emperor. Soon another plebiscite was held, in which an overwhelming majority of the French people approved the new title, effectively doing away with the French Republic. So it was that on the 2nd of December, 1804, in the presence of a reluctant Pope Pius VII, Napoleon placed the imperial crown on his own head in a magnificent ceremony in the Cathedral of Notre Dame, becoming Napoleon I, Emperor of the French. Meanwhile, Dissatisfied with the terms of the Treaty of Amiens, England had delayed compliance with its terms, maintaining its presence in Egypt and Malta despite France's compliance with the parallel clause calling for the evacuation of Toronto. Citing Napoleon's annexation of Piedmont as evidence of French imperialism, English diplomats had conveniently overlooked their own annexation of Ireland two years earlier. In addition, Having already tried and failed to incite royalist insurrections in France, England financed similar efforts in ostensibly neutral Switzerland, to which Napoleon responded by assembling a council of that country's leading citizens and formulating a new Swiss constitution. Readily accepted by the Swiss, the resulting act of mediation worked to deprive English banking interests of a lucrative venue, hardening the will of the English still further. Next, in March of 1803, King George III called for additional levies of militiamen in response to an alleged French military buildup along the Channel, despite repeated statements from his own ambassador that no such buildup was afoot. At this point, Napoleon sought to accommodate English interests by offering to cede possession of Malta for another four years. But the English responded by upping the ante still further demanding the French evacuation of Switzerland and Holland in what was openly described as an ultimatum. A week later, the English ambassador returned to London, and on the 18th of May, 1803, 
English naval forces seized two French merchant ships. Once again, the two countries were officially at war. Organized hostilities would not break out for another two years, however, during which time the Royal Navy helped deliver Spain into the French camp by seizing a Spanish treasure ship. Declaring war on England in December of 1804, Spain put at Napoleon's disposal many additional ships of war as well as hundreds of miles of coastline from which to launch attacks against the island nation. By the summer of 1805, the English had offered subsidies of some five million pounds to Russia, Austria, Sweden, and Naples, and the Third Coalition came into being. In a combined effort to rid the continent of the threat of republicanism, plans were undertaken for simultaneous advances in Italy, Bavaria, and Hanover. Of the great powers, only Prussia remained neutral, and only in order to reap the spoils of the coming conflict. Napoleon, meanwhile, had been busy rebuilding the French navy and assembling a large land force in and around the channel ports in anticipation of a seaborne invasion of England. To this end, he ordered Admiral Villeneuve, commander of the French fleet at Toulon, to put to sea and sail for the West Indies, where he was to rendezvous with various French and Spanish squadrons, assembling a combined fleet of some forty ships of the line. Villeneuve was then to make for the English Channel, where the massive army Napoleon was assembling at Boulogne would embark for the crossing. Though the plan relied heavily on the skill and daring of the French navy, the expedition had been organized down to the last detail and showed early signs of success. Getting under way in April of 1805, Villeneuve successfully eluded his Royal Navy counterpart, Admiral Nelson, who, anticipating another attack on Egypt, was busy patrolling the eastern Mediterranean. A month passed before the English Admiral realized his error, at which point he immediately set off across the Atlantic in pursuit, leaving European waters even as a mounting threat loomed in the Channel. It was everything Napoleon could have hoped for, and upon Villeneuve's return from the Caribbean, the way seemed clear for the planned cross-channel invasion. After fighting an indecisive battle with a British blockading force off the northern coast of Spain, however, Villeneuve inexplicably lost heart and turned south, making for Cadiz. At this point, on or about the 26th of August, an exasperated Napoleon gave up his plans for a cross-channel invasion and prepared to march against Austria, ordering Villeneuve to take his combined fleet back to the Mediterranean ports. By the time the French admiral was prepared to carry out this order, however, a British blockading force off Cadiz had been joined by Admiral Nelson's fleet, and a major sea battle loomed. Hoping to elude the British blockade and slip eastward into the Mediterranean, Admiral Villeneuve departed Cadiz at dawn on the 21st of October, and with 33 ships of the line, began making his way along the coast. No sooner had he put to sea, however, than the English blockading force, sighting his long line of sail bearing away to the east, closed in, at which point Villeneuve ordered his fleet to put about on a return course for Cadiz. His first instinct being self-preservation, the French admiral made for the nearest safe harbor, and in accordance with conventional naval tactics of the day, ordered his ships to assume a line-ahead formation. Nelson, meanwhile, with 27 line-of-battle ships, determined on a plan of attack calling for two columns of sail to strike the enemy line at an oblique angle, his idea being to penetrate the enemy's formation and create a seaborne melee in which the initiative of individual captains would come into play. In addition, the plan would enable the English ships to fire broadsides in two directions at once, while the French battle formation allowed for the concentration of fire in only one direction at a time. The French would be further disadvantaged by their recent about-face, which left their line in somewhat ragged order as the British Lee Column under Admiral Collingwood bore down upon it. Penetrating the enemy line as planned, Collingwood's ships delivered double-shotted broadsides as they passed and then swung to leeward of the enemy vessels to fire again at point-blank range. Next, Nelson's column hit the center and forward end of the French fleet, cutting across and through the enemy's line of sail and delivering thunderous salvos in both directions. Aiming for Villeneuve's flagship, Boussentour, Nelson, in victory, 
passed immediately astern of his counterpart and fired a 68-pound ball through her cabin windows, followed by a keg of 500 musket balls. Shortly thereafter, the British ships Neptune, Britannia, Leviathan, and Conqueror followed up the attack, firing successive broadsides at Bucentaur until, with over 400 dead littering her decks, the French vessel struck her colors in sign of surrender. By this time, victory had engaged the redoubtable so closely that the two ships became inextricably tangled, whereupon French troops made several attempts to board, only to be mown down by British infantrymen. Later, during a lull in the fighting, Nelson was on deck surveying the situation when a sniper perched in the rigging of Redoubtable found his target. Striking the admiral in the shoulder, the bullet passed through his spine, and slumping to the deck he was quickly carried below. Meanwhile, the opposing fleets continued to hammer away at each other with well over 4,000 heavy guns, volley answering volley in a grisly battle of attrition. Having pulled away from the rest of the fleet shortly after the initial engagement, some ten of the leading Franco-Spanish ships under Admiral Dumanoir managed to put about in the light air and now bore down on the remaining ships of Nelson's squadron. Once again the superior gunnery and maneuverability of the English ships came into play, however, and Dumanoir's attack was soon shattered. By 4.30, much of the Franco-Spanish fleet had been reduced to smoking hulks laden with the dead and dying. Only thirteen ships managed to get away, making variously for Cadiz or the Mediterranean. Remarkably, not a single British ship was lost. Similarly, Allied casualties are thought to have been as high as 14,000, while the British counted some 1,700. Among these, however, was that of the commander. Having remained conscious during the latter part of the battle, Nelson survived long enough to receive confirmation of the English victory, a stunning triumph that would confirm his legend as the island nation's greatest naval hero. Indeed, a more heroic end could scarcely be imagined, for the British victory at Trafalgar would ultimately prove a turning point in French naval fortunes. With the elimination of a large portion of the French and Spanish fleets, the Royal Navy became the undisputed master of the seas putting an end to the threat of a French invasion of the English homeland and granting the Royal Navy freedom of movement along the entire sea-bound coast of Europe. In response, Napoleon undertook fresh efforts to establish a continental blockade of English goods. Yet without an effective naval presence, the blockade would be all but impossible to enforce, and the continued domination of British sea power would make the long European coastline a liability rather than an advantage. Within two years, the British would establish land bases in Portugal, opening a new front from which to challenge French control of the continent. In late summer of 1805, with Villeneuve's fleet no longer expected in Bologna and Austrian troops massing in Italy and Tyrol, Napoleon made a dramatic change of plans. Abandoning the notion of an invasion of England, he determined instead to employ the massive army he had assembled in and around the Channel ports in a campaign to oppose an anticipated Allied advance up the Danube, which, if launched, would pose a direct threat to the French homeland. Comprised of over 200,000 men in seven self-sufficient corps, what had been known as the Army of England now became simply the Grand Army. On the 24th of August, Napoleon ordered the army's cavalry commander, Joachim Murach, to assemble his forces along the Rhine opposite Baden in the Black Forest, and three days later, under heightened secrecy, the great mass of infantry followed, heading for positions along a front running from Mayence to Strasbourg. Once the corps were in place and all preparations made, the army would be poised to make a concerted thrust eastward with the goal of isolating the Austrian army before it could unite with a Russian force advancing through Galicia on the northern border of modern Ukraine and Poland. For their part, the Austrians anticipated the French plan and moved quickly to preempt it. On the 2nd of September, a large Austrian force under General Karl Mack advanced into Bavaria and began concentrating on Ulm, forming a defensive line running roughly from Lake Constance northeast along the upper Danube. With the Prussian territory of Ansbach securing his right flank, 
Mac prepared to confront an anticipated French drive through the Black Forest, while a Russian army under Mikhail Kutuzov was on the march to join him. There was only one catch. Neither Allied commander had taken into account that the Russian calendar was fully ten days out of step with the rest of Europe. Thus, the Russian advance on which Mack was depending would be ten days late getting started, and with over 600 miles to travel, could not be expected for several weeks. The error would prove decisive. By the last week of September, having learned of Mack's incursion into Bavaria, Napoleon was ready to launch his own offensive. Breaking off diplomatic relations with the Austrians, he left Paris to join the army, and the next day his leading corps crossed the Rhine at Strasbourg. His general plan was to suggest an advance through the Black Forest, as Mack anticipated, while the bulk of the army actually swept eastward along a broad front running as far north as Mayence. A lack of bridging materials delayed three of his corps, but by the 30th all were across the Rhine and pressing forward deep into German territory. On the 3rd of October, in a move calculated to throw the enemy further off balance, the northernmost French corps crossed into Ansbach, violating Prussian neutrality as they raced for the Danube. Prussia could be dealt with later. Napoleon's first concern was to concentrate east of Ulm and trap the bulk of the Austrian army in much the same way he had in the Marengo campaign. Taken by surprise, General Mack, who had been waiting for the heads of the French columns to appear along the expected route through the Black Forest, suddenly found himself massively outflanked and powerless to prevent the enemy from crossing south of the Danube to a position in his rear. Once again, an otherwise capable old-school commander had simply failed to account for the speed and audacity of the French advance. Even so, recognizing the hazard of attempting to retreat under such conditions, Mack gamely sought to hold on at Ulm in hope of relief from Kutuzov. Meanwhile, anxious to cut off all lines of retreat, Napoleon pressed his army forward. On the 9th of October he advanced as far south as Augsburg and as far east as Ingolstadt, putting himself squarely across Mack's line of retreat. Assuming that his foe would attempt to escape to the south, he made little allowance for an Austrian withdrawal to the northeast, across the wake of the French advance. Compounding this error, Marshal Ney, who had been ordered to push the remaining Austrians out of Ulm, crossed most of his force to the south bank of the Danube to link up with the rest of the army, leaving only a single division north of the river at Albeck. Unfortunately, this came about just as Mack moved to break out of the trap and on the 11th the French general marched upon Haslach only to run into two Austrian corps moving in the opposite direction. Putting up a strong defense, the French managed to stave off disaster and retreat under cover of darkness, leaving the Austrians in a position to visit a good deal of destruction on the French supply trains. The fighting at Haslach had worn out much of the Austrian cavalry, however, and with inexplicable optimism, General Mack postponed the advance until the 13th, interpreting reports of French movements westward from Landsberg as a general retreat back to France. This was wishful thinking indeed, for his escape route was about to be cut off, leaving him completely surrounded. Alerted to the precariousness of his situation north of the Danube, Napoleon ordered Ney to recross the river, and on the 14th, Despite the partial destruction of the bridge at Elchingen, Ney's troops stormed across what remained of the battered structure and engaged the Austrians in a running ten-hour battle, pushing them back upon Ulm. Though originally reproached for failing to secure the crossing, Ney would later be granted a title for taking the town, becoming the Duke of Elchingen. At this point, Archduke Ferdinand broke with the Austrian field commander and bolted toward Heidenheim, taking with him as much as a third of Mack's remaining force, including his heavy guns and the army's supply trains. The escape was made with no time to spare. By the 16th, two French corps had returned north of the river to invest Ulm, and Murat's cavalry was hot on the enemy's heels. Meanwhile, the remnants of Mack's army held out in Ulm in the forlorn hope that Kutuzov would arrive in time to relieve him. Four days later, with the Russians 150 miles away and already exhausted by their advance, 
Max surrendered. Thus far, Napoleon had driven his troops at a nearly superhuman pace, and with the remaining armies of the coalition still bent on his destruction, there would be little let up. Despite the burdens imposed by a large number of stragglers and as many as 60,000 prisoners, in the week following Max's capitulation, the tireless French emperor restored his communications, disrupted by Ferdinand's escape, brought up fresh supplies, and prepared for another advance. On the 26th, he was under way again, pressing his reorganized corps forward in three columns with the aim of defeating the Russians before they could be reinforced. Meanwhile, upon learning of Max's surrender, Kutuzov, with only 36,000 road-weary troops, had begun withdrawing to a point northeast of Vienna to await the arrival of another Russian army under General Buxhoden. At the same time, in an attempt to delay the French advance, the Austrian emperor attempted to open peace talks. Napoleon, who had made several peace overtures in advance of the stunning French victory at Ulm, would have none of it now. Pressing his main force eastward, he sent Marshal Ney south upon Innsbruck, where the fiery corps commander drove an Austrian army under Archduke John through the Brenner Pass. Once again the speed of the French juggernaut took the enemy by surprise, forcing the Austrians back by the sheer momentum of its advance. Reaching Vienna on the 15th of November, Napoleon took up residence in the Schönbrunn Palace, from whose elegant windows he could look out upon the fruits of an amazingly swift and successful campaign. Even belated news of Villeneuve's defeat at Trafalgar could not tarnish his recent successes. And yet the military situation was still highly uncertain. Now over 400 miles from France, his army worn out and much reduced in number by two months of hard campaigning, he faced a combined force of some 86,000 men, mostly Russian, with another larger Austrian army under Archduke Charles on the way north from Venetia. In addition, Prussia, with another 190,000 men, showed every intention of joining the Allies at the first opportunity. At this point, Kutuzov and his Austrian allies lay northeast of Vienna at Olmutz, where they were joined by a second Russian army under Buxhoden. Initially, the Allied commanders planned to await the arrival of Archduke Charles, whose numbers promised a combined strength of some 150,000 men. This would take time, however, and the Allied armies were already exhausting the limited resources of the Moravian countryside. It soon became apparent that, with winter fast approaching, they must either force the issue or retreat and await the next campaigning season. For Napoleon, the opportunity offered to strike before the enemy could recover his strength, and thus he undertook an artful ruse, advancing somewhat tentatively upon Brunn and calling for negotiations. Thinking the peace overture is a sign of weakness, Tsar Alexander advanced upon the village of Austerlitz, and on the 30th of November offered to make peace on the utterly unrealistic condition that the French evacuate all territories occupied since 1792. The Russian emperor had clearly taken the bait. Napoleon, of course, refused the offer, yet timorously withdrew from a central plateau known as the Pratzen Heights, a move designed to bolster the Tsar's confidence. And sure enough, encouraged by continuing signs of French anxiety, Alexander occupied the high ground with plans to strike southward, envelop the enemy right, and cut off the French retreat toward Vienna. What he did not realize was that he was rushing into a carefully laid trap. At 7 a.m. on the foggy morning of the 2nd of December, 1805, the main Allied attack stepped off in the pre-dawn twilight, descending from the Pratzen Heights and advancing on the villages of Telnitz and Sokolnitz. Here, a tenacious French defense, supported by the timely arrival of Davout's corps, held the Austrian advance in check along Goldbach Brook, the fierceness of the French resistance eventually drawing additional Allied forces southward and creating a noticeable gap in the Allied line. Meanwhile, from his headquarters on a hill immediately south of the Olmutz Brunn Road, Napoleon could see above the fog to the heights opposite, where he detected the enemy's movement to the south and the resulting weak spot. 
It was the opportunity he had been waiting for, and having massed the bulk of his forces north of Kobelnitz, he sent Sewell's corps forward to occupy the vulnerable Russian center. Rising up out of the fog-shrouded lowland, Sewell's two divisions caught a single enemy corps in the midst of displacing southward. Sweeping an allied covering force out of the village of Pratzen, one division attacked the hastily reforming troops, and a series of fierce charges and countercharges ensued. Next, the second division fell on the enemy right, and under its weight the allied lines broke apart and began streaming eastward toward Austerlitz. Scarcely pausing in the wake of this rout, Sewell's divisions wheeled right and pressed southward against the Allied flanking force, which continued to be stalled around Telnitz and Sokolnitz. Recognizing the danger, Kutuzov ordered his entire reserve forward to regain the heights, achieving a momentary success when the Russian Guard cavalry overwhelmed an isolated French brigade. Napoleon responded by sending his own Guard cavalry forward, and in a series of determined charges, the elite French horsemen captured the bulk of their enemy counterparts along with their commander. At this point, the rest of the Allied reserve broke and ran. It was now noon, and above the billowing smoke of battle, a bright sun shone in the blue December sky. Soon to become part of the growing legend of the Grand Army, the son of Austerlitz would come to symbolize the moment of victory and with it the army's effective domination of Europe. The battle's final action occurred on the extreme flanks of the two armies. To the north, Russian General Bagration seized the village of Boselnitz in an attempt to turn the French left. Coming under the muzzles of the French batteries on nearby Santon Hill, however, the Russians were soon blasted back and set upon by Marat's cavalry. Meanwhile, to the south, after several hours' respite, in which he was joined by various reinforcements, Sewell descended upon the now-isolated Allied flanking force around Telnitz. Already thoroughly demoralized and disoriented, the exhausted Russians and Austrians attempted to orchestrate an orderly retreat, but were soon fleeing for their lives. Chased across the frozen surface of a nearby pond, many were drowned when French artillery fire broke the ice. Meanwhile, in Austerlitz itself, all was chaos, as Russian and Austrian troops streamed into and through the town, creating mass confusion. By four o'clock, the day's bright sunshine had given way to an approaching snowstorm, and for the Allied forces, the day ended in sudden darkness and abject defeat. To be known as the Battle of the Three Emperors, Francis fled with Alexander during the collapse of the Allied right, Austerlitz is widely considered Napoleon's greatest tactical victory. Both in the build-up to the battle and in the deployment and movement of troops on the field, he showed a clear mastery of both the terrain and the psychology of his opponents. At a cost of some 2,000 French dead, the Grand Army inflicted over 15,000 casualties and captured another 11,000. Strategically, the results were even more significant bringing about the collapse of the Third Coalition and effectively offsetting the naval defeat at Trafalgar. Employing a species of soldierly understatement, the new master of the continent delivered an official proclamation to the army. Soldat, je suis content de vous. Soldiers, I am pleased with you. To the rank and file who held him in awe, the commander's simple statement of satisfaction was received as the highest of honors.